So the Caroline Shipman used to be the Open SFS uh, chairman uh, back in 2013. He was also at Oak Ridge National Labs and is now at uh, Los Alamos. Um, and he said some words back in 2013 that I still think of today. Oops. So why is hierarchical storage management such a critical component of, uh, of a luster uh, file system deployment? It, it depends on the site, but for many sites, they want to be able to use low-cost, um, low-performance media for storing vast oceans of data. And have the ability to transparency, transparently interact with that low-performance storage through their traditional high-performance infrastructure, so you can easily stage data sets in and out of low-performance, low-cost storage, but still get the high bandwidth that's available in your primary storage environment. Uh, the critical feature that CEA uh, rose to, to the challenge of developing, uh, in fact, probably one of the, the largest uh, the contributions from, uh, from the community uh, to date, and uh, we look forward to that being in, in the latest uh, Lustre release, Lustre 2.5. So we jump forward and we have that now. So when I think about hierarchical storage management, I think about the data that is in those systems. And the data should, um, will always outlast the hardware. It's always going to be more important than the hardware that's there. So we need to think about how we do this migration. And uh, Daniel Sport really talked about how can we manually manage that, how can we look at doing that ourselves. But if we think about Lustre HSM, we can look at using the underlying technologies within the HSM to try and ensure that those forward migrations don't adversely affect the users as we go to new technologies. So just an overview of Lustre HSM. The key features that you get from that are data migration capabilities, being able to free the disk space within the environment and restore data from that underlying HSM lower cost storage tiers. You get the pod policy management capabilities with uh, migration and <coughs> releasing a data blocks um, with the soft RM. Um, we also have the capability to import from an existing backend, which uh, enables you to be able to implement a new Lustre file system with your existing HSM backend and literally just switch over the new one very quickly and recall the data blocks as required rather than actually doing the long term migration. This type of process is good for some and maybe not so good for others. So it's something that you can think about within some of your deployments to be able to quickly move that Lustre file system technology to a new generation and keep it up and online, as well as for our disaster recovery capabilities. So how many people here today are actually looking at Lustre HSM or running it? One, and maybe two or three at most. Okay. Um, how many people are actually aware of Lost HSM and understand what its capabilities are? Okay. Definitely a few more, so that's good. Okay. So the three main actions that we get from Lost HSM is the ability to archive, release, and restore. So the short of that is, is copying the data from the Lost file system into those lower tiers of storage, whether they be tape or some made-based technology, so spinning disks that can power down, um, or even cloud-based storage. We have the ability to release those data blocks within the Lustre file system, which is where you're investing a lot of your money to actually get that high-performance uh, storage capability. So we can release the data blocks in that <coughs> area of those lower tiers, and when we need those data blocks to be within that high-performance file system, we can restore them. Now, that can be an automated process on um, when users actually access the data, or it can be a manual process to recall a batch of data, which is obviously the most uh, efficient way of working with large data sets. So, how does it come together? So, there's four main components. There's a coordinator, which runs on the MDS. There's a policy engine, which is today uh, primarily Robert Hood. Um, there's a copy tool, and in our case we have a DMF copy tool, which is specifically for our HSM environment. There's also a POSIX-based uh, copy tool, which comes standard for lots of HSM, which can be used to uh, work with Robin Hood to copy data to uh, POSIX-based uh, file system target. And there's the HSM itself. So in our case, it is the DMF HSM. 
the copy tool runs within the HSM environment and the policy engine typically runs on a separate server. Um, it's, uh, there's a number of, uh, I guess, stories that you can hear from uh, uh, NCI in relation to Robin Hood. Uh, a lot of these things have progressed over time and now with Robin Hood 3.0 they've addressed a number of issues, um, especially within uh, larger environments. So, the coordinator. Um, so it manages the HSM requests and ignores any duplicate ones within the queue, builds up a queue of what it's going to do and then dispatches those uh, across the available copy tools that are there. Within the case of DMF, we actually run a single copy tool um, and the DMF managed environment then spawns multiple uh, copy processes and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, a little bit later. So the coordinator also manages the logs um, in relation to what's happening with those requests and um, can actually re-establish where it was up to in case there was a crash or a failure within that, uh, within that copy process. So we can manually manage that and also we can tune it um, by stopping, resuming, purging, um, etc. Um, timeouts and simultaneous requests. So the policy engine being Robert Woods running on a separate system, the policy engine which is managing those pre-migration Purge policies. There's also, you can also use the policy engine to do a variety of other things. Some sites actually use it to find candidates uh, of data on scratch file systems that uh, haven't been accessed for a period of time and then just uh, remove them rather than actually using it for its HSM capabilities. So it's quite a useful tool. Uh, it's a user space tool that communicates with the MBS and the coordinator, and um, it's also a change log, log subscriber uh, with the Lustre file system. So it's, when it initially runs, it needs to scan, basically scan the whole file system, but as the file system is uh, running and changes are occurring, it's uh, keeping an eye on that and triggering actions as, um, uh, as they are required. So there is a Robinhood user group. Um, it's, with, <coughs> it's on either side of the uh, lab. So it's uh, currently in France this year, uh, September 19th, um, I think it's a, a small community that's actually growing, uh, so there's a lot more that's happening in the Robinhood space. Um, I mentioned Robinhood 3.0 is the current version. So Robinhood's uh, main role is to uh, monitor the change logs and the OST usage and uh, look at how that relates to the policies which have been def uh, defined. And then from that, make decisions on what to do, whether to archive data or off somewhere else or release data to um, or disk space and also restore data from the copy target. Um, supports uh, new features within uh, 3.0 including the user group usage accounting type thing with file size profiling, um, speed ups down with uh, DU and find which was a significant issue in uh, from the uh, 2.x series <coughs> and as well as customizable alerts on the file system entries and it's also aware of the last OST and cool layout, so uh, striping, <coughs> which is very important for when they're migrating data out and restoring data in, you want to maintain those stripes. Um, also, a file system uh, does ask for recovery tools. Uh, currently, it's using the MySQL database or the Marina database, Maria database. Um, although, there may be, uh, I guess, opportunities to move to newer databases in the future. But they're the ones today. So the three main policies, uh, migration policy, purge policy, and remove policy. So as I said before, you can use Robinhood um, just to find candidates to actually remove from the last file system. Uh, there are some people that run very strict rules on a scratch-based file system, whereby files, they don't want files to remain resident within that scratch file system. So you can actually use Robinhood just to find those candidates and remove them. That's what you would like to do. Um, but it's, it, the best use case of it, uh, Robert Hood, is in uh, conjunction with the HSM and the back end, and to look at active data migration between those tiers. Those policies can be defined on uh, standard uh, attributes um, um, and uh, utilizing uh, Boolean type expressions uh, based on path size, owner age, attribute or modification times, uh, access times, uh, the common type of uh, rules that you would see within any HSM environment. Um, the 
Uh, you can also define whitelists of files that are uh, not going to be candidates for this type of migration capability, which is very useful if you've got projects that uh, need to remain resident for a period of time or um, uh, file sets that are related to particular jobs. So key use cases, um, HPC active backup. Uh, what I mean by active backup is all files are dual resident, so you want to make sure that you've um, actually got a point in time backup of data as it is within your um, last file system, and as files change, you keep doing that. So the HSM itself is managing a snapshot type capability <coughs> within that HSM. Um, there's obvious caveats around that within how you manage that uh, HSM environment and the policies you have defined within that HSM environment. Uh, HPC disaster recovery, so obviously if there's a major issue with the luster based file system, you want to be able to restore the content very quickly. You can do that when, it, when all the data is within the H, uh, HSM environment. We can also look at optimising the workflow, so adding to your uh, NPI job submissions, you can uh, ensure that all the data required is recalled to the luster file system before the job is run, and then actually look at releasing those back into the HSM environment. So rather than having users uh, required to copy data from one file system to another file system. So we can reduce that data movement over the network. Uh, persistent HPC storage, which uh, obviously NCI has been doing for quite a long time. But um, when we think about persistent HPC storage, we want to ensure that that, start, that data is protected. So rather than creating replicas between multiple file systems, we can push that down into the HSM environment, store it on um, you know, multiple or in the cloud or other um, storage systems within those lower tiers. And one of the other key goals is to reduce those costs within the master file system because there's a large investment in infrastructure that's required to have a performance file system. So you can start rather than looking at delivering capacity within uh, that performance file system tier, you can focus on just the performance and then focus on capacity within those lower tiers. Um, the long-term HTC archives and as well as an active archive. And the difference between those two, I would say, is that the long-term HPC archive is typically looking at slower um, uh, storage devices within the HSM layer, um, whereas the active archive is looking at uh, faster mechanisms within those lower tiers, but still uh, cost-effective storage. So, DMA with the last one. Um, so when we think about uh, data assurance and reliabilities, there's a, a common approach, a best practice approach, which is this 3 2, one approach. So having um, three copies of the data, a performance copy, secure copy, and a disaster recovery copy. Um, spreading that across two different media types to avoid any particular type of media related problems. Um, and that may be a you know, disk based technology, uh, maybe object storage, maybe traditional tape type infrastructure, or even two different types of tape media. Um, I have, when I was a uh, sysadmin, I did actually see a problem with a batch of tapes, and so 100 tapes that were all bad because they came from the same batch. So you can avoid that by using two different media types. And uh, the obvious one is an off-site copy. And how that off-site copy is done um, could be as simple as putting a load of tapes in the back of the truck and driving them somewhere else that's off-site. So at a high level, how does that look? Well, you've got your traditional luster configuration with your MDS servers and MGS running, the object storage servers within that environment. We have a management network that all of the nodes connect to. You've got your luster clients, um, our HSM environment, so the DMF, um, as well as the policy engine. So they are all uh, a member of that luster cluster, um, either clients or servers within that environment. And then there's the lower levels, which is the DMF managed environment, which may have its own InfiniBand or fiber channel fabric, or may have direct SAS attached storage to the DMF servers themselves. No, I just for sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in previous slides previously uh, using this as like a backup solution, and I sometimes have arguments with people who are confusing. HSM to back up. And my understanding of how this works is that once once the policy engine is decided to migrate the file and then it needs to free up the space, then a metadata is kept on the metadata servers and the, the data is kept on the 
probably be back by week two. So, and if you do lose, you know, if a disaster lose that, there is methods of reclaiming the, some, most of the metadata from what you archived off. So, I wouldn't really call that a backup solution. Okay, so within the DM, within DMF, so when we, um, so we think of just the HSM environment rather than with Lustre as well. We traditionally we have a disk cache, okay, and that's the managed file system, and data comes into that. We then um, migrate data down to the lower tier, so we create a copy of that data, and it may actually reside in a dual state. We create two copies on the tape, but then over time that file may change, okay, so then we create another copy. As long as we don't run a process to recycle those tape volumes, we've actually got the data blocks preserved at that point. <coughs> If we've made a, which we should have done, made a backup of our inodes and our database and logs and everything that's required within our DMF environment, at that point in time, we also have a metadata snapshot of what data was at that point in time. So if we keep these and we don't recycle the volumes, we do have the ability to go back in time and grab those copies. So that's kind of the, the backup capability. It's not a traditional backup whereby you're running, um, you know, network or a common hall or something like that. Um, you don't have access to really simple GUI tools where you can look back in time, but you do have the tools and the capability to get that data back from that point in time as long as you've kept that, that snapshot. Yeah. So it's about delivering the capability. So the DMF structure with Lustre sitting on top of it, um, I look at it really as a performance to capacity and a cost relationship, with the highest cost and highest performance being at the top of the pyramid, and the highest um, capacity and slower performance and lower cost being at the bottom of the pyramid. Excuse me. So DMF manages data throughout its life cycle. Um, it's completely automated data migrations into second or third tier storage, um, all of which is transparent to users. Uh, DMF uh, has been around for over 25 years and actually in production at customers for over 25 years. Uh, NASA and CSIRO are two customers that have been running DMF for 25 years. It has an active user community within um, Australia. Um, so every year they have a user community conference. This year is in, uh, or next one coming is in February next year. And uh, we've actually been starting to get uh, speakers coming from Singapore as well that are actually running there now. Now this is 100% run by the community. SGI supports it, but we don't run it. They run it and organize it. Um, I mentioned in this layer here this zero watt storage. So it's focused uh, primarily on main based storage, so massive array of hard drives. So hard drives that we can actually spin down. So we can save on power, but uh, we get the characteristics of disks. So we actually get that random access capability and that very fast access to data that we don't get from tape. Tape's really good at large sequential transfers. The uh, cost profile of the, the disk-based storage compared to tape, tape is actually very comparable. And this is just a dumb uh, J1. You know, all the smarts are actually done in the software for those capabilities. So how does the communication and data flow within a Lustre DMF environment look? Um, well, with the coordinator running on the MDS, <coughs> Policy engine, so Robert Hood in this case, uh, we're determining uh, the candidates uh, for migration. <coughs> the coordinator is then talking to the copy tool. Um, so earlier I mentioned that you know you can have multiple copy tools, and, and that's true. So you can actually get multiple copy processes happening at the same time. Within DMF, we actually only need to run a single copy tool. But within our environment, we also have a scale out architecture for parallel data movers within DMF that can migrate data directly to. Uh, tier 2 and Tier 3 targets. So we don't need to have a Tier 1 disk cache within the DMF environment. The data blocks go directly from Lustre to the lower tiers via the data movers. So the single copy tool then commutes, so DMF communicates to the parallel data movers. The parallel data movers then do the block-based transfer and the metadata updates uh, then occur within the DMF environment. So the DMF metadata service for managing administrative file systems as well as the database and the inodes associated with the data that's under management, the data blocks go directly into the lower tiers, so direct from Lustre to Tape, for instance. So that's 
So you can actually, once again, reduce costs in the disk-based infrastructure that you need to invest in. So just on that, if you don't mind. Yep. So within the cluster building blocks, if you have a game agent that actually communicates directly with the data models, is that right? Okay, so everything on this screen is connected to a common uh, InfiniBand or OmniPath or Ethernet-based fabric <coughs> and all members of the Lustre cluster. Okay, so they all need to be running a client. Um, it's, it's not a, a, a true schematic diagram, it's just a high-level representation of how the communication occurs. But yes, they all need to be on the same fabric. <coughs> So how does direct archiving work? So we mentioned the high performance disk cache. Um, so typically what we want to use this for within our DMF environment is purely for uh, managing the inodes within the DMF um, environment, the DMF database, as well as the other administrative file systems within that environment. So logically the metadata updates are going directly into the DMF inodes and into the DMF database, whilst all the data blocks are actually going directly down to those lower tiers, directly to tape or directly to um, a disk-based storage tier. So what we end up having is more of a true HSM environment, rather than actually having from a disk-based storage system to another disk-based storage system and then migrating that within that DMF environment. So you can actually get an optimised data path from Lustre to your lower cost uh, tiers of storage. Um, so key differentiators for us is the parallel data loops. So as I mentioned before, DMF can actually have multiple servers that are part of that DMF environment. So we actually have a scale-out architecture for HSM, um, which is very compatible with um, a Lustre-based environment. So if you wanted to have a high-performance HSM, um, Lustre HSM environment, you want to be able to move lots of data very quickly, you can scale out that back end you know, to, be, uh, to match your front end. Um, we simplify the communication within uh, the uh, copy tool. So we're running a single copy tool instance rather than having to switch <coughs> multiple copy tools. So it's one communication from Lustre and then DMF manages that within its environment. The direct archiving capabilities, so we're moving data efficiently. We're going directly from the lower, uh, from the lower tiers direct to Lustre rather than through inter uh, um, rather than additional steps going through other tiers of storage. We have access to the spin down disk capabilities which give you um, a tape-like storage um, system, but with disk um, characteristics for you know, the ability to spin up very quickly, the random access capabilities of disk as well. Um, being in production for over 25 years and a very active um, community. Uh, this is the link for the DMF user group. Um, it's uh, managed by the guys at CSIRO. Um, it's currently been active for nine years now. Uh, SGI also has a, a standard implementation service in relation to Lustre and Lustre HSM deployments, um, including the pre-sales um, engagement of your existing environment, um, determining the best match for what your actual needs are there, um, through to our services that go on site to connect and verify Apple hardware, installation of software and configuration of the software environments, including the rules that, that match what your workflow requirements are, through benchmark testing, documentation, and uh, handover to local uh, on-site support staff, as well as knowledge transfers and training. And I've just got three customer examples to finish off with. So we've got Zions uh, over in France, I'll probably pronounce that wrong, but it's a national supercomputing uh, center. They've been um, running uh, Lustre with DMF since 2015. So they were very early adopters of this uh, technology. Um, so they like paved the way for many users to be able to take advantage of the fixes and the uh, updates that were actually applied to Lustre HSM throughout that time. Uh, they're still actively using it today. Um, they've got a capacity of 3 petabytes and uh, 50 gigabytes per second and are due for an upgrade uh, soon enough. Their environment, they have a scratch-based system and they have a scientific data store. You can make a project store, you can make a persistent uh, store. But their goal is to protect that very important scientific data, um, which they gather from many institutions around France. And so, once again, the, the data is the most important thing. You know, the hardware is going to change over time. Uh, we have a performance, uh, high performance automotive manufacturer, so a uh, Formula One engine manufacturer that we can't mention. Um, so, <laughs> it's 
they're running in the last district quite quite. The, the funny thing with that is, is if you mention any Formula One uh, customer, uh, you have to pay them. So they are a marketing engine, so we can't uh, mention them. Um, so the, all of these customers are running in Lustre, the A version of Lustre 2.5, and they're on DMF 6.5. This customer has been in production since 2015 as well, and it's a one petabyte uh, capacity and five gigabytes per second, and it's an active archive. So they, are, they have a reasonably small front-end plus file system, so they're actively moving data between those tiers. Um, and the last one is University of Queensland. Um, so we deployed a DDN Exascaler solution. Uh, so DDN Exascaler is based on uh, EEL. Um, our other customers are actually running EEL. This uh, presented some challenges, but uh, we worked with DEN to ensure that we would have a smooth deployment there. They did testing for several months and they're just going into production now. So it's 1.9 petabyte uh, system, 20 gigabytes per second. Um, and at the moment, uh, they don't have uh, more data than what they have lost to cache, so they're running in a dual state. So um, they've got quite a, a while to go before they start taking advantage of the um, actual HSM. Um, 